Welcome to The Neutral Ground. This week, my guest is Dr. Dwayne Armitage. Dr. Armitage has written a fascinating book entitled Philosophy's Violent Sacred. In the book, he makes the claim that postmodern thinking fails to come to terms with the role that violence, through victimization and sacrifice, has played in the creation of Western thought and ethics. He looks at this relationship through the eyes of social scientist slash philosopher René Girard. In this episode, we talk quite a bit about Girard's ideas, and we also discuss Nietzsche and Heidegger's understanding of power and truth. And finally, we spend a bit of time talking about how we speak to each other today and how we seem to be pursuing different ends but never quite meet on the same plane. This is a very intense episode, but I hope it's a good one. If you enjoyed the episode, please make sure to hit the subscribe and or follow button, as every bit of support helps bring our message of civil discourse to more people. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dr. Dwayne Armitage. Dwayne, welcome to The Neutral Ground. How are you doing today? Good, good. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. My pleasure. So we're going to spend quite a bit of time today talking about a fairly thick difficult concepts, not things that are that will be brand new to my audience. But I want to make sure that we're all on the same page with some of this background information. I've, I've talked about postmodernism before on the show as a kind of skepticism, particularly a, a skepticism of grand narratives or meta narratives. But I, I want to make sure that we have a, a good understanding of how you're using it in your book as well. So could you just talk a little bit about how you understand or approach postmodernism in the book? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I agree with what you said. I, the way I understand postmodernism is really the French reception of, uh, you know, 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s even, uh, and then it's already in America, of German thinking from the late 19th, early 20th century. So uh, Nietzsche and Heidegger in particular. And it's dealing with a question, um, particularly postmodernism as it's received from those thinkers in France. It's dealing with the question of what's the cause of violence and victimization? So it's the aftermath of the Second World War. What the hell happened? What what happened here? How do we explain this? And they come up by, you know, taking bits and pieces from Nietzsche and Heidegger, um, almost putting them together in a very interesting way. And then Karl Marx in some ways uh, and coming up with an answer to that. that The cause of this victimization and violence is Meta narratives, as you said, the leotard says the incredulity, incredulity toward meta narratives. Um, but really, the idea is that the cause of violence and victimization is rationality itself, or absolute truth, uh, or what's sometimes called essentialism. These ideas that you know, when we parse the world up in terms of rational categories, that they exclude and marginalize, like Michel Foucault says. So that's the idea: is that postmodernism is fundamentally this French reception of German thinking that criticized truth, reason, and essentialism, and really metaphysics, and. Um, there's one more thing I was going to say here. Uh, the idea is that these, you know, reason, absolute truth, in essence, uh, they they come to be uh, uh, violently instantiated in the world. And that's what happened in the Second World War, that somehow these ideas are exclusive. Uh, they they privilege one thing over the other thing. And, you know, with, with essence, for example, like male over female, things like this, the Jacques Derrida talks about. But essentially, that's that's my idea here is that it's a critique of reason and it's critiquing reason pre- precisely because it's trying to respond to what happened uh, in the 20th century uh, with, with, you know, the Holocaust and the Second World War. Now, although you you use Nietzsche and Heidegger throughout this study, and we'll, we'll get to them in, in a little bit. You, you're looking at this postmodern problem or this idea of the violent sacred through the eyes of a uh, social scientist, philosopher René Girard. Can you give a little bit of, of background information on um, how uh, Girard's understanding of the relationship between, let's say, postmodernism and the violent sacred here? Yeah. Okay. So that's a, that's a that's a question I have to explain uh, something earlier. Girard has a different take on the cause of human violence. So he disagrees with that idea. He's well aware of it disagrees with it, read Heidegger and Nietzsche very carefully, I think has brilliant interpretations of them, had a lot of respect for them. But essentially, Gerard thinks that violence is not caused by truth or reason or intelligibility or essences, but rather there's something inherent in human beings that's violent. In particular, uh, and this is the cool thesis that's been backed up by, um, uh, I don't know, uh, I'm trying to think, a moral psychologist like Jonathan Haidt says something like, well, group formation is the cause of victimization and violence, that human beings intrinsic to when we get together and mobilize, like the word mob is in there, uh, there that, that almost always there is an other 
that we're mobilizing against, namely a scapegoat. And the, the, that social cohesion is formed on having a scapegoat. Now, this is largely unconscious and as people are doing this consciously. It's actually an evolved mechanism. And this, this mobilizing and this uh, group formation, uh, what sometimes he calls it the scapegoat mechanism, is inherent to what he calls the religious impulse in human beings. And, you know, I mentioned Jonathan Haidt. He talks about areas of the brain that activate when we're in, like, even at concerts and religious formations, political rallies. And it's like this religious impulse that we sort of have. And the reason Gerard says we have this is that human beings are so uh, mimetic, that is, they're so imitative. And because of this, we're also hyper violent and we're also hyper prone to killing each other. And the only reason we didn't, you know, kill each other all off is that religion evolved as this evolutionary mechanism to sort of let off steam uh, for when, um, uh, you know, tensions in the community would amass so so heavily that it was at the point of war. Uh, what human beings would do, would mobi they would mobilize together and find a scapegoat and then have social cohesion and a kind of cathartic peace after uh, victimization, which was largely unknown to them. They believed that, um, uh, and you see this now too, that when you talk to people in the political arena, and you see this uh, most prominently, is that they really believe that the people they are against uh, are evil and guilty. And the same thing in, in the religious impulse as well. So uh, you get morality and religion out of this uh, social cohesion uh, hypothesis, namely that violence is caused and inextricably bound with group formation, mobilization, religion, et cetera. Connected with this too is, is um, and I return to this from your book, as I was saying, I was looking at more of Gerard's writing, is Gerard's, let's, let's call it the, the triangle of mimetic desire, essentially, right? And this is, <clears throat> I think, really important for us to understand early on too, because this is connected to the idea of some of the strife that we see uh, throughout history and e even today as well. Can you talk a little bit about that triangle as well of desire? Yeah, so mimetic desire is always triangular, as you say. Uh, it means that mimetic desire just means I imitate the desire of another. So there is no intrinsic desire. I always learn my desire from somebody else. So I'm, uh, let's say I'm looking at you and I think, oh, well, great. I should start a podcast. This is wonderful. I think this is a great idea. And I, I start to imitate you and you become the model for my desire. But very quickly, uh, we realize that as you model that desire, you become an obstacle in the way of the desire. So maybe then I start a podcast and then I'm checking your views and you're checking mine. Now, all of a sudden, we're rivals. So imitative desire ipso facto leads to conflict and rivalry because the model almost always becomes the obstacle. Right. And you see this. He gives a great example. No, he doesn't. He, he, he's read Freud very carefully. and He doesn't agree with uh, the literal interpretation of the Oedipal complex in Freud. But he says, if you notice there, there's a kind of mythological or symbolic uh, reading of the Oedipal complex. The, the child learns the desire uh, for the woman or for the mother through the father. And then the father, of course, becomes the obstacle, because here's the thing. As you as I desire, you know, back to the back to our, uh, the analogy between you and me, as, as I imitate your desire, you start imitating my desire and vice versa. And they're they're. It becomes a conflict there. And so in the Oedipal complex, the, the male child murders the father, marries the mother, that kind of thing. But that, that notice in Freud, you have imitative desire and then conflict that ensues. So that's his basic idea. And he, you know, uh, before we recorded, you mentioned uh, you were reading, uh, rereading maybe Deceit, Desire in the Novel. It's a book I hadn't spent a lot of time with. I mean, I've read portions of it, but I don't know a lot of the novels in there. But there he, he really traces that through, um, uh, uh, you know, literary history. Uh, but he does it later on through religion in Violence and the Sacred, Mythology seems to represent this very interesting, like the Oedipal uh, complex. Um, um, what's another example? It's in the biblical tradition. You know, even in, in the New Testament, uh, talks about, uh, for example, Jesus being uh, uh, handed over to the uh, high priests out of envy. So Pilate recognized that they were envious, and there's an envy going on there because you wonder well, why why was he so threatening? Well, envy, and it's interesting that he he talks a lot about envy, Gerard. It's the one sort of dev, uh, deadly sin of the seven deadly sins that no one wants to admit they have. You know, no one would admit that I'm envious of somebody else. It's almost, or it's even equally as weird to say that person is envious or jealous of me. It's kind of thing we don't talk about because it's so unconscious. Uh, it's so powerful, I think. <clears throat> and built into that envy too, as you're saying, is is also an underpinning of power. And 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 Nietzsche and Heidegger, I think, both kind of understood that power is never really something that ends, an end result. It's always in a state of creation and continuation. So as you are envying that person that you, you're modeling, you're also secretly, or maybe even not secretly, you're trying to surpass them. But there is no real sense of when it should stop. And that's why religion comes in, right? 
Yes, absolutely. So uh, you can think of that impulse in, that Nietzsche identifies as will to power. And Nietzsche talks a lot about will to power. What is will to power? What does will to power want? Gerard says, well, what Nietzsche is saying is will to power wants the insurmountable obstacle. Nietzsche says will to power wants more power. And it's just constantly striving for more and more power. And it's endless. It's almost like this, this loop that's playing out that's never satisfied. And so that's what's awakened uh, in human beings uh, by way of their mimesis. So it's a problem for human beings. It's also our greatest strength because we're hyper imitative, but it's also leads to the problem of violence for Gerard, which is a very, again, a very different thesis from the postmodern uh, position, which says violence is caused by meta narratives or something or absolute truth and things like that. Yeah. And it doesn't even have to be thought of necessarily as, as, um, as an evil. In other words, human beings have, have a way of, of trying to seek power to do good. But the problem, of course, is unless you've also established an ending for that, like a clear purpose, you will continually just build that momentum toward a never-ending kind of cosmological chasing of power. And in some ways, that's what happens here in especially modern postmodernism, if you'll allow me, a kind of a flunkyism or postmodernism of, of today, is that there never seems to be a clear sense of what is the ending or where is the ending. Yeah. Yeah, I always tell my students, uh, that's Nietzsche there. I always tell my students, Nietzsche is 100% right about 70% of the time. You know, power is a very powerful, powerful, it's a very uh, powerful explanation. It, it's almost like um, the way Daniel Dennett talks about uh, Darwin's hypothesis, that it's this universal acid that eats through everything. The problem is if you give power all that control and say power is the fundamental explanation of reality, then it destroys even the predication that power is the fundamental explanation of reality. In other words, you explain away explanation. You can't even explain anything if everything's about power, because even that explanation would be not an explanation, but it would be about power. And so I think Nietzsche needs to be, you know, contained within a larger sphere of metaphysical, of the metaphysical and the Judeo-Christian tradition, things like this. Um, but Nietzsche, too, this, this idea about power that Nietzsche, if, if Nietzsche is right, if, if, you know, and that's what postmodernism is essentially saying, that, look, we criticize everything in the world and reduce it to power structures. And when, when we have that, we critique reason and what's left after reason, power. Right. Uh, power is the fundamental explanation. And then power naturally bifurcates into the strong and the weak. And then we have collective identities being the primary way we understand people. And that's not to say we don't need to understand them that way, but that's the primary way. And Nietzsche asked this question, which I find fascinating that Gerard sort of brought out in Nietzsche, namely, wait a minute, if power is the fundamental way of understanding the world and the world bifurcates into strong and weak, splits into strong and weak, why side with the weak? That's just an arbitrary, you know, sort of idea we inherit from the Judeo-Christian culture. There's no reason. And Nietzsche, Nietzsche really took this seriously, which is very strange. Um, uh, in the Antichrist, for example, he says, let the weak die off. Let the weak and the ill-constituted perish. This, this is the first principle of my uh, philanthropy. He says, let them, they're, they're ripe for destruction. It's a kind of uh, radical social Darwinism in Nietzsche. But I think Nietzsche is right that if the world is simply power, we have no good reason or explanation for siding with the weak other than 2,000 years of catechesis in Judeo-Christianity, which is Gerard's point. Yeah, you, you jumped right to my my big question at the end here. So let's stay here. That's good. No, I was going to say that you have you you have quite a bold um, and yet at the same time terrifying question here that you bring up toward the end of, of the book, which which you stated that if if it all comes down to just pure perspectivism at a certain point, right? And we're and you have the perspectives that are just simply shooting for power in in various ways. What is it that is forcing us or making us, because it, let, me, let me backtrack for here for a second. You make an excellent point that in even our present day postmodern ideals, it is quite the good thing for us to, in a system where we see clear oppressor and oppressed, to side with the victim and say, let's try to help them come out of their situation, right? That's very lauded today and, and understandably so, but... What you point out that was fantastic is again Nietzsche's question of why? Why is it that you're doing that? And in doing so, Nietzsche, of course, exposes that underneath even the postmodern belief that it's nothing but non-truths and 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 that's it, is still a Judeo-Christian ethic that's there, that's saying, we know why you're doing it because you believe it's the right thing and because that has been inherited. Exactly. It reminds me of, a, of an argument I had a couple of years ago with a colleague uh, in philosophy who was saying, look, relativism is the only way uh, uh, to you know, prevent violence and to prevent people from hurting each other. And I said, well, why is that wrong? 
He said, what do you mean? Why is that wrong? As if this is just it, as if he never asked the question. It's so axiomatic. It's so uh, it's 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 the unconscious absolute of our culture that, of course, you have concern for victims. What are you talking about? Of course, we're against depression, uh, uh, persecution. Uh, it, this is what is so, this is what is meant by social justice. Social justice is this absolute that we don't even question. But for the longest time, social justice was not an absolute. And it's an invention, according to Gerard, of the Jewish people. The Jewish people began to tell that mythology of uh, collective victimization from the perspective of the persecuted. And then you get reversals all over the place of of classic uh, perennial myths. Like, for example, uh, Joseph and Potiphar's wife in the book of Genesis is, according to Gerard, anti oedipal So you have the mother and the father. The mother hits on Joseph and Potiphar is like a a father figure. Now, Joseph is completely innocent. And what is Joseph rejects her and then Potiphar casts him out. And so it's an anti-Oedipal telling of the story. And there's countless examples of this. Cain and Abel, uh, Joseph in general, he's always being uh, the psalmist, you know, is constantly, why are they doing this to me? You know, uh, the Jewish people themselves. And then, of course, in the New Testament, uh, Jesus is the God man who you're walking through the whole story where he's, you know, he's innocent and people are, and it's interesting when you look back and reread the new Testament, for example, with with a Girardian lens, you see, Oh my God, they're trying to mob him. That is kill him constantly. And he's evading them and things like this. Then at the end, when he's on the cross, there are people going, this guy's innocent. You would never have people say that uh, in an, in an ancient mythological uh, tale or something like this. And Gerard's point is that's where this absolute comes from because you have to ground it. Now, Nietzsche was aware that this absolute had no ground. And so he just got rid of it. And then of course the Nazis read Nietzsche and said, oh yeah, okay. Even though Nietzsche was very much against uh, German not national socialism or nationalism at the time and against anti-Semitism, uh, the, the Nazis I think have a good uh, right or a claim to Nietzsche because he does get rid of uh, 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 the concern for victims. And that is, that is essentially what I think right-wing violence and right-wing fascism is. It's the uh, return to the mythic sacred. It's the casting out of the social justice narrative, that, that kind of thing. So I, w- I wanted to make a, a point here because you made me think also of even Ishmael and, and Hagar as well. And something that I've always thought about and, and wondered about was how almost out of, out of place the passage is when we follow Hagar and talk about her being upset and what she has and thinking, you know, that doesn't have to be there. It doesn't actually, right? In in just a purely theological sense, it would be completely understandable for it to simply say, cast Hagar out, and then we move on. But there's that concern that you were talking about for the, the victim. Yeah. Oh, gosh, absolutely. It's all over the place, too. Uh, reminds me that where you get a sense of, you know, Hagar's uh, internal feelings. It's like yeah. when Peter betrays Christ, uh, and then he goes out weeping. That would never, nobody would care about the guy betraying his master and then go, about his internal uh, conflict within, or, you know, uh, then this idea about caring about the least. Um, when when Nathan goes to to David and says, you know, look what you did. That, what, wait, somebody's going to tell the king off, you know, when the king, the king is going to be exposed as this victimizer and that's bad. You know, it's just, it's a very weird telling of history. And people pick up the, the Hebrew Bible and think, this is weird stuff. And I'm thinking, look what it's saying. It, you know, it's so obvious to us. This is the problem. We can't read it because social justice and concern for it's so obvious to us because we're in a Judeo-Christian culture um, that uh, and it was obvious to Karl Marx as well. This is, of course, it starts off with obviously you care about the working class and the poor and things like this. It's such an obvious point. This was, I think, the, the point of your, your question that this, this, why is it obvious? And what's the point here? Why, why do we accept this? You know, I think it needs to be grounded. And of course, not to get too far ahead again, but Nietzsche was very worried about the death of God. God is dead and we have killed him. What does that mean? You know, so he proclaims, proclaims the death of God, I think around 1950 something or 1850 something. And uh, he's saying, look, when you unchain the earth from the sun, you unchain the metaphysics, the grounding and the ethic and the ethic starts to take on a life of its own. And it's no longer tempered by the metaphysic. And that's a very dangerous thing. I think we're seeing it play out in, in, you know, as you said, modern postmodernism or modernity or postmodernity, whatever, you know, this is one of my, my pet peeves that I'll come across with students sometimes is they will (laughs) happily proclaim themselves as nihilists and, and talk about how, uh, how wonderful and, and freeing, you know, the death of God is by Nietzsche, but I'll, I'll tell them, I'll say, listen, do me a favor, go back and reread it, reread what Nietzsche is actually saying. He's not, he's not saying that this is a wonderful thing. He's not telling you to be nihilistic. He's saying this is going to be a big problem in Europe for, for 100 years. 
And so it's not necessarily something that you're supposed to be aspiring to. Now, could you always draw from great ideas and and create something within yourself that you can use effectively, you know, in, in a positive manner? Of course. But Nietzsche is not saying that this is a great thing, that God is dead. He's saying you're we're losing that underpinning of the Judeo-Christian Western subculture. And unless we can find something to stand in its place for Nietzsche, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, for Nietzsche, that would have to be drives, the drives of the creative, essentially, right? But my question always for Nietzsche there is, are drives really enough for us to continue as a species and to, to move forward? Yeah. Okay. Wait. So there's two things here, and I want to talk about both of them. So um, I'm trying to think of which one do I to address first. What did you say right before that? Oh, um, yeah. The the death of God initially and nihilism is experienced as a kind of liberation. This is great. There's no rules. There's no right and wrong. Values are socially constructed. For about a week, for me, that was cool. Or maybe I don't know, a couple of years. But eventually, you start to realize, wait a minute. There's no God. Uh, there's nothing. Nothing's right or wrong. Where does meaning come from? All of a sudden, that you could it can initially be experienced as a kind of liberation. He says this in the in the second chapter of the genealogy of morals toward the end that it initially is a liberation, uh, but then it's it's a recipe for despair. And what's interesting, what he says here, and I think Freud takes this from Nietzsche that um, it's not as though our conscience is just going to go away. So this touches on what we were talking about earlier. And when you can't relieve guilt. Uh, people experience uh, depression. And Nietzsche says this, and Freud thought depression and uh, guilt were went hand in hand. It was a kind of uh, these aggressive instincts turned inward on the self. And the problem is, you know, when you have a religious system set up to, re- you know, ego te absolvo, uh, relieve the guilt, great. But once the religious system and the metaphysics is thrown out, you don't, you don't lose that sense of morality that's been, you know, pushed in us for at least 2,000 years. Right. And so people are going to have a lot of mental health issues precisely because they don't know what to do with the psychic energy that would have been directed toward morality when when everything was fit. And so it goes goes, leads into your second question about drives. Um, I think you're right. I absolutely agree with you that Nietzsche's solution is terrible because um, his his solution is essentially to become the ubermensch, the super person who can create value, who who can value posit and to be. He actually says this is a conscious liar (laughs) because all art is lying and everything is a lie because there's no truth, of course. Uh, But the, the question I always have, I think Heidegger is better. And this is Heidegger's really critique of Nietzsche, that people don't experience value that way. You know, I don't when people people say this all the time, you know, when I'll talk to um uh, I don't know, uh, a new nihilist, someone who's just read Nietzsche. Well, I can find meaning. And I, I say, is that really how you experience meaning? Do you seem to do you seem to create it or make it or no, you find it. Notice what you say. But I think what they mean is they they put it there. But no, most people experience meaning coming at them. And that's the phenomenological point that meaning is out there. And we're experiencing this. We don't really have control over what we find beautiful, attractive, uh, meaningful and things like this. Nietzsche's point is we ought to. And I just don't think I think that's a failed project because, well, I think he, he's on the right track about the creative and the, the sublimating of uh, desires and things like this. Um, I just think the Ubermensch is a failed project because it doesn't really we, that's not how human nature is vis a vis value and meaning. Yeah. And people sometimes, I think, forget, too, that even in um, and I'm probably going to butcher the quote, but even in Sartre's case and existentialism is a humanism, he talks about very clearly he's got a, a line that's easy to miss. Where he says, you know, in actuality, the existentialist is quite disturbed by the fact that there is no God because then we lose the a priori uh, understanding of, of meaning and value. So even, even Sartre has to acknowledge that, look, we got to be careful. This is actually quite a problem that we're trying to deal with here. You know, that's it's great you brought up Sartre, because what I love about Sartre is he almost takes Nietzsche and just drives him, you know, puts it in overdrive. Because one thing that people, even nihilists, will still cling to is the uh, the myth of love and there being the, the myth of Eros, there being the one out there. Not for Sartre. Love is fundamentally sadomasochism, was what he says. It devolves into, it's crazy. He has a whole section on this. Love is, you know, hell is other people. Love turns into either trying to dominate a person or letting them dominate you. That's fundamentally what human relationships are all about. And I give him credit because at least he's taking that Nietzschean power thesis to its logical conclusion. And so he dispels even that myth. And, that, you know, yeah. And he's, 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 uh, and you're right that you're right to say too, and I think most people miss this, that both Nietzsche and Sartre are disturbed by, by their own. Uh, musings, yeah, and their own observations, yeah, yeah. So let let's dive into some of these other claims as well in the book because I, I just find them to be really fascinating. One is you talk about how, in Gerard's eyes, Christianity essentially 
de- destroys or, or deconstructs myth in general. Why? How is that the case? Okay, so what he means by myth again? I've, I've sort of said this, but you know, it was sort of in Kuwait earlier. Uh, myth is simply that violence, the scapegoating mechanism of the mob uh, toward an innocent person. But the, the but it's the it's this scapegoating ritual told from the perspective of the mob, right? So it's a perspectivism, right? And what Judeo Christianity does is begins to tell the story of victimization from the victimizers or victims, excuse me, from the victim's perspective as opposed to the victimizer. So uh, Gerard sees in the Hebrew Bible and then in the New Testament a slow deconstruction of mythology. And that changes culture. And what I, what I think is really interesting is it, and Nietzsche said this as well as much, but he thinks it's terrible, you know, that, that, of, you know, he calls it the slave revolt in morality, right? Which is essential, which is invented by Jews essentially. Um, and then taken over by Christians, you know, so who, who's on the throne in Rome now? It's a, it's a basically a follower of Jesus of Nazareth. Um, uh, what, what I think is interesting about Nietzsche and Gerard's claim in the in this deconstruction of myth is you don't find this ethic, this mercy ethic, uh, this social justice ethic anywhere else until uh, the Hebrew Bible, which is very weird. You know, and you could think of it in a very naturalistic or evolutionary uh, way, an explanation by simply by saying, well, look, in wars, you know, uh, the victors would simply uh, uh, assault all the women, burn all the books and destroy all the temples. And so they would wipe out the loser in the culture. But for some reason, the Jewish people's text survived and they'd survived as a people. And, you know, through oral history, whatever, and the Romans uh, let the Jews um, as a culture survive because they could prove it was very old, right? Very dangerous thing for Rome because you have you have preserved there what it's like to suffer from that perspective. And then you get an entirely different religion. So essentially, this goes back to Nietzsche's point that values are created. There's only two ways of creating values because there's really only two uh, perspectives on power. Either you have it or you don't. And values are created out of the perspective of power, which you find yourself in. So if you're in a powerful perspective, you're going to look at the world as Nietzsche says, according to master morality, where good and bad are simply what's powerful and uh, bad is simply as eh, something you don't need. It's sort of ugly and decadent, this kind of thing. However, if you're from the loser's perspective, which most people are, uh, you're going to look at the world very differently. You're going to you're going to create a value system out of that perspective, and that's what Gerard is taking from Nietzsche there. And that's what he means by the deconstruction of mythology, because mythology is simply master morality. It's simply this narrative of religion, of mobilization, of group formation, of victimization, of the scapegoat mechanism told from the persecutor's perspective. And then, for some reason, the Jewish people survive; their texts survive, and that is another voice uh, from the persecutor's perspective. So let me let me kind of push a little bit here because the in a in a previous episode I, I spoke with uh, Angus Fletcher who who's in his book he talks about the neurobiology behind how we read stories and what that actually does you know for us and we talked quite a bit about uh, Milton and Milton Satan and you mentioned in your book Satan and the idea that Satan is a kind of representation of violence which I found interesting because the of course for longest amount of time satan is the father of lies so you've got lies and violence mixed in together here why why is satan kind of the representation of violence and and is there a is there a kind of miltonic potential problem in that satan takes on the role of the model of victimization instead of christ as the romantics read him that's interesting. That's a very good question. Uh, so Gerard has a thesis on what Satan is, and I I don't know what I think of it. I think it's interesting. He reads Satan as a kind of literary trope, maybe, uh, that, you know, from the Hebrew, it's not this, you know, the, the idea of the fallen angel and Milton and stuff, put that, you know, bracket that for a second. What he sees is Satan, he finds, I, and some people, uh, you know, there's debate over whether this, this Persian route to the Satan uh, as the accuser is correct or not. Uh, but nevertheless, he, Gerard sees the Satan as a kind of kingdom of mythic violence where it it, pres- it has a kind of benefit and burden it, it it victimizes obviously an innocent person to preserve the peace and that's the kingdom of satan and how what the satan is is the mob accusing the innocent victim and getting the innocent victim to say uh yes i did it and to admit guilt that they didn't do and it's interesting that this is really this is really in the background in the new testament as the satan particularly the Johannine uh gospels and letters um, where you have uh, the opposite of Satan being the paraclete or the, so there's this courtroom metaphor and you see it all over the place in, in the Bible, uh, Hebrew and New Testament, 
that you're in the court, God is the judge, and then the accuser is the Satan, you're going to be accused. And then, you know, the advocate or the counselor, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, legal term, uh, is the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, or sometimes God is the advocate, or Jesus is the advocate. But that's how Gerard sees Satan as this, he's the sort of voice of persecution from the mob's perspective. And so the, the, the satanic voice is always the voice that accuses. You're guilty of this. You deserve to be punished. You're guilty. And Gerard, what Gerard's saying, I think, is really cool, is that uh, that if you're being victimized, you're always innocent. So it's always wrong to accuse. It's always wrong to, uh, to victimize. Even if somebody is guilty, it's still wrong to accuse and mobilize and to, and to be violent. So Gerard has a kind of pacifism in it as well. Um, but I'm going, I'm going too far ahead. But back to your question about Satan. Um, so you asked, you know, about Milton and is, is Satan now becoming the victim? Yeah, the because what, what it made me think of was the romantic reading of Milton Satan is essentially that he's the victim, right? The dark romantic. And so the accuser then would be who exactly? Because it, it's also one of the reasons why I find it so fascinating is because I was trying to think about it from the standpoint of the accuser. And the, accu the accuser is still himself. Because that's that's the part, and I guess that's why I wanted to ask you about this, is is this a kind of just a fascinating anomaly, or is there is there more to it maybe that we can kind of uh, work with here? Yeah, this is a really good question. I think you're right that once, well, okay, so go, so Satan is a kind of tragic figure, and Gerard has a lot to say about tragedy. It's, it's a kind of in-between, between myth, where you have the victim is guilty, and then the Judeo-Christian tradition, because in tragedy, there's a kind of recognition, like, so Oedipus, you kind of feel bad for Oedipus, but he's still guilty, and he deserves to be cast out and rip his eyes out, etc. Now, what's interesting is, in the Byzantine period, so uh, uh, Gerard points this out, that uh, Oedipus, the Oedipal story, Oedipus was read as innocent. He was read as a kind of Christ figure, so he was unjustly accused. And so I wonder if it's not the power and the pervasiveness of that Judeo-Christian narrative being beginning to sink in all of culture. So now we even look at the quote myth of Satan. And so now we even apply that social justice or that, that anti-victimization narrative to Satan as a tragic figure. And I think that's right. You know, I mean, if, if Satan is, is more than a literary figure, you know, a fallen angel or whatever um, that's within, you know, this is the totalizing narrative. And I think this is a good thing to start looking at even, guilty people as somehow tragic or innocent in a certain sense. So, um, and the reason I say this is because, uh, and Gerard says this as well, but Nietzsche in the second chapter of uh, genealogy, something that's I'm always thinking about is when we, we see figures, um, when we, 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 um, when we enjoy the suffering of another person because they're guilty, that's just an excuse for cruelty because cruelty is the enjoyment of someone's pain. You know, and we, we couch it, Nietzsche thinks, in all these, you know, ju injustice and things like this. So it's just that, you know, we per we do this now with when we with cancel culture. We, we find somebody who did something wrong, you know, whether it be 40 years ago or whatever. And we say, no, it's good that they fall. It's just um, reminds me. I, I tell this story to my students a lot uh, that, you know, w when the Catholic Church, when all that was in the news about the molestation scandal and things, I was talking to somebody and he said to me, uh, I, I, you know, just put me alone in a room with that guy with the baseball bat. And I thought. What this guy is saying is he wants to beat another man with a baseball bat, but under the guise of justice, that's completely fine. No, he's venting his cruel instincts. And that's the problem when we look at the world in terms of good and evil in that way. And I think what the the, the genius of the Judeo-Christian narrative is that we start to humanize everybody. And so I wonder if that, so back to your point about Milton Satan as a tragic figure, I think that's what's going on there. And I'm not sure that's a bad thing. Wow, you really made me think of something here, actually, because I, I whenever I, I had the opportunity to teach Milton, and I haven't in in a couple of years, I do spend quite a bit of time thinking about, you know, I, I kind of set them up for it, as we, we are wont to do sometimes. I'll ask them, do you feel bad for him? And of course, these students tend to respond, yeah, I feel terrible. And I'll, I'll kind of say, okay, so you feel sympathy for evil. And they 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 get very uncomfortable because when you start to put it in their mind, and and we'll we'll kind of break down why that's okay, and why that is a very, you know, Christian concept. The idea of even the worst, the worst of us, and and you know, this is difficult for us to say today, but even the worst of us. You have to try to find some sense of humanity in that. If not, then you might as well cast us all out. Right, right. Absolutely. 
I mean, so it's funny you say this. I think that's great that you do that. And you, you highlight that. Um, I've been reading a lot of uh, Gandhi and Martin Luther King as of late because I need to, it's hard to internalize that. And of course, you know, it's, it's interesting. Martin Luther King talks about, look, nonviolent resistance isn't just an external thing. It's an internal thing that we want the beloved community. We want reconciliation. And one of the problems I think that, you know, what, what postmodernism uh, fails to do is that if it takes away that metaphysical foundation of anti-violence, and then you know, and I think one of the theses in the book of that, that I tacitly sort of accept is that postmodernism becomes a kind of neo-Marxism, uh, and if the world is just about power, then what happens when the proletariat gets power? Well, they abuse it just as badly as the as the you know the bourgeois. So, you know, when does it stop? You know, how do you put an end to? violence and victimization. And I think it means forgiveness and reconciliation and loving your enemies, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, blessing those that persecute you, that kind of thing. And, and notice we permit in our culture, we permit violence and victimization so long as it's done in the name of victims. So we can victimize, but only as a, uh, as a, as a kind of um, an ethic that's for victims. So victimization uh, is good only with a certain reservation. Uh, and Gerard thinks that that's the spirit of the Antichrist because it lets violence back in. And I think the Judeo-Christian ethic only works if it's anti-violent, you know. So um, the reason why, you know, this comes to mind is Marx's critique of religion is it's the opiate for the masses. And he says it's the opiate for the masses because it quells, it numbs the pain that you should feel at injustice, that anger that you should feel at injustice and that should spur the revolution. And I think that's the problem with Marxism. It's the same as postmodernism. There's nothing to stop the, the cycle of violence. And so I think if you don't do what the, what you're talking about that you do in the class with Milton and with evil, and I'm not saying sympathize and justify evil, but I'm saying the goal is always redemption, uh, forgiveness and reconciliation, or Martin Luther King calls the beloved community. And it's amazing how that idea is just taken away in, in, in modern politics on both sides, the beloved community. Yeah. And the goal, of course, is to never get to the point when you need it. That's something that I think we've lost as well is is get to a point where we don't even need to have the conversation about the uh, the redemption instead you hit the person early so that you can stop whatever that terrible event or whatever thing stop that from happening and the way you do that is by constantly reassuring by moving the individual by by getting more i, I mean i've been talking quite a bit about about the humanities in general and and one of the downfalls when people complain about the humanities is because we've moved a little bit toward highlighting more of the the author or ourselves over letting the work itself speak right like as if as if Milton or or Melville or anybody else needs me when in reality the work itself is what does the greatest teaching and what what allows a genuine a genuine transformation to happen in the individual so that they've already by the time they they reach that moment of making the decision to create a a victim out of someone they have a means of transferring that knowledge to say I'm not going to do it and I know why and that's what I think gets lost a lot today is to not always deal after the fact, stop the event from happening. That's where we need to get back to. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. I, 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 don't, I don't know what to add to that. That's, that's really well said, yeah. In your book, you talk about turning the other cheek. And, and the real point of that is to say, not that you are just a submissive being, but in actuality, you're saying, I'm not going to be a hindrance to your violence which means you don't have to overcome me. Therefore, you're not actually building power here because there's nothing to overcome. The idea being that I can cut off your search for power by ceasing to be an obstacle. Right, exactly, exactly. So you drop out of the, out of the, so what, what Gerard sees, um, when somebody is engaging you in that, they're asking you to imitate them in their violence. So he gives the example of, you know, imagine if you shake out your hand, to, to, you know, stick out your hand to shake somebody's hand, they don't shake it back, immediately you pull it back. Now what you've done is imitated their, you know, rudeness, so, so to speak, and that, that gets amplified, of course, in violence, things like this. And the Christian idea is to observe the rules of the kingdom. It's in, it's in the, uh, it's in Proverbs and things like this. If your enemy's hungry, give him food. If he's thirsty, give him drinks. You heap burning coals on his head, things like this. 
but it becomes sort of amplified in, in Christ's teaching and Sermon on the Mount, things like this about loving enemies. It stops and thwarts the negative mimesis, uh, negative imitation. So you don't get engaged in a battle. If somebody That means when someone makes excessive demands on you, give in immediately so that they can't, as you said, so it stops their uh, their violence. And it, it's interesting. And so when Gandhi and King, to return to them, uh, when they talk about this, this isn't, this is a kind of resistance. It takes courage to do this, but it's saying, I will not imitate their evil because I will not let it infect me. And of course it's in the Platonic tradition as well with Socrates. You know, he talks about this in first book of the Republic and the Crito that you should love. He doesn't say you should love your enemies, but he does say you shouldn't do harm to anybody. Even if people harm you, that's not justice because it, it preserves the soul, so to speak. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. How, how does all of this, how did your your pursuit of this subject change the way that you look at the world and the way that you participate in humanity? Oh, boy, okay, so I think it makes me, I think the most important thing I can draw from, from these thinkers is that I, I am very wary and self-reflective whenever I'm a part of a group. You know, so it's like the, the, there's something uh, really insightful about the Woody Allen line, I think, that, you know, if I wouldn't be, want to be a part of a group that would want me as a member or something like this. I forget how it goes. But in other words, I'm always very um, careful about when I'm around a group of people or what I'm identifying with in this group and what my positions are. Because as soon as we're around a lot of people, that that switch in our brain goes off. Group, oh, this is my group. And there's something in us that will search for the other or the enemy. And I think what's interesting about the Christian community is that Gerard points out is it's a, it is founded Christian Christian the Christian community is founded on violence. It's but it's it's founded on the death of the founding members. So instead of looking for another, he's going to die and found a community around his death. And so that's what the Eucharistic celebration is, that people come together and remember, oh, wait a minute, we're the victimizers. And so we're actually reenacting the death of Christ. The we're, it, Gerard reads the Eucharistic celebration, which is the heart of Christian worship, as a reenactment of the lynching. And so we recognize that we're lynching this person and he's forgiving us. You know, And so that's, that's a kind of negative, uh, kind of, what would be the word, a, a, a photographic negative of the violent group formation. And so what I draw from this is that I'm very wary of groups. And of course, just because you're in a, in a church called Christian doesn't mean that you're immune from uh, negative group formation. Matter of fact, we see it all the time with religious people. They, they, they get right back into persecuting people. And so that's no inoculation from it. But I think what you I think the most important thing to take from this is we need to be wary about our groups, our political groups, our religious groups, and to recognize that we're not scapegoating and victimizing when we do it. And so this brings, um, and especially when it comes to the political insights that, that, that come out of Nietzsche, Heidegger, and Gerard, um, it's always a balance for me of, of trying to balance, or always a problem of trying to balance charity with truth. And I don't think you can have one or the other because they'll spiral out of, out of control. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm learning to do that. I don't know when, when, when is it, you know, <laughs> when is it good and, and fruitful to just be quiet and not ar not get in endless arguments with people? Because you're usually not going to convince people of these ideas because it's also I want to have the debate on another level. Uh, so the political debates that are happening right now, I think they're always talking past one another. Nothing will ever get resolved. I think it's better to move that debate to the metaphysical, to the ontological, to the philosophical. And then you can undercut, you know, and then you can find common sources of agreement. But I, I find people don't want to do that. So those are the two things. Have the debate on a philosophical level rather than a political level and be wary of group formation. There's one other thing I wanted to bring up to you. You mentioned about turning the other cheek and things like this. Um, and it's connected to what you can bring out of this. But uh, before we before we were recording, you talked about the metaphysical and the need to you know for sacred space and things like this. And Gerard sees in Christianity and the Platonic tradition, because uh, Plato is very interested in mimesis. It's about, uh, but it's about imitating the other world, not this world. And so one way out of this mimetic rivalry uh, is to learn to imitate these universal ideas, like the good, the true justice, things like this, the forms, um, which is Christ is always saying, imitate me who imitates the father. And there's no rivalry there because these things are accessible to anybody. And so I think one of the, one of the negative problems, again, uh, uh, that comes from death of God is that we don't have a metaphysical space. And we don't have that space for proper mimesis. And when we don't have that, that space for proper mimesis, namely the metaphysical, we're going to constantly fight with one another. And, and it exposes to, uh, built into the Christian tradition, is, is the idea that we are already insufficient to be a proper, um, what would Gerard call it? He's got subject, object, and the, 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 um, at the Modern top of the triangle is, is the, the, uh, the model, right? Yeah, yeah. we'll call it yeah. the model. Yeah. You, you are already insufficient 
by definition to yeah. really be a true model in the Gerard sense that you can you're strong enough, good enough to uh, to sort of uh, bathe the other two, right? And so believing in that in in that insufficiency, you're also not going to necessarily try to to lord that over others. And so you're not, I think as will as you're not as willing to instead of putting good as a model, you want to put truth. And the and, and Nietzsche would be the one to say you're following nothing. You're never going to get there because I hear a lot of people today as well as as a big part of their conversation they're, they're constantly saying uh, I only follow the truth. And I just sit there and I go, I, then I, I don't know what to tell you then, because it's been known for thousands of years that your truth is not necessarily my truth. And so by doing so, you're, we're always going to be parallel and we're never going to meet. Instead, you and I need to sit down and establish almost like Rousseau, like a general will of truth for us, for our conversation. And when we can find that model of let's say good um, humanity, integrity, when we can establish that, then we can have a political conversation. But until we create that kind of necessary model, that top of that triangle, there is almost, dare I say, it sounds terrible, but there is almost no point in even having the conversation. Right, absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> well said. And on that I note, had another on that picture. terrible note, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. Um, I do think, though, you know, the question of truth is very was one that's very dear to me about how we understand Nietzsche's critique of truth. And that I, I, I we need to be aware of our uh, so there is an insight in the postmodern critique that people who think they have the truth um, very readily, almost almost always smash people over the head with it. However, I don't think we should give up the pursuit of truth, uh, but we have to be very careful about who we are, and what we're, you know, what we're looking for in our ability to be biased, things like this. It doesn't mean that we can't, that we can have, that there is no neutral perspective because I do think we can access truth. I just think it's very difficult to do, you know? But it's gotta be, it's gotta be big enough and universal enough that we can come to it together, right? Because that's built into the religious structure, especially in Judeo or the Abrahamic religions. You have this idea of, we know what the logos is. We know what the truth is. Therefore, we can speak together in that cultural context because we know where the end is. And either we agree upon that or, you know, th that's why sometimes when you'll have conversations with someone, two Christians having a conversation, if one of them goes radically to the left, I mean, it, it creates a genuine disturbance in the conversation. Like, well, now I've lost what I can say to you or, or how I'm understanding you because we have that logos, that built in structure of the model of the truth. Yes. Yeah, that's right. And I think one of the, the one of the most pernicious ideas in postmodernism is the, is this, you know, axiom that we can't ever do that. And I think that that's problematic because then it would, then it leads to this point you were making about just kind of going on and on endlessly, because if somebody doesn't, if, if we, if we decide ahead of time that, I don't know the truth. You don't know the truth. You end up in this thing. Um, and there's insight into this as well, but um, into a kind of, sometimes it's called standpoint theory that really no one has access to the truth. So we might as well just listen to the victims. The problem with that is that very quickly turns into authority, you know? So, and this is a danger in Heideggerian phenomenology as well. If you can't access the truth, forget about the mind's access. Well, just describe, then you have to take on authority things. That, so rational debate and reason and reasoned argument and then genuine conversation, which is very difficult, is, is thrown out. I, I have to believe that we can come to, like you, you were saying, I have I still believe in the power of logos and the power of reason. And if people are sincerely committed to that, but that's, you know, of course, difficult to find people sincerely committed to discovering the truth, which would involve admitting that you're wrong at times and things like this. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, on that note, let, let me say, uh, I absolutely love the book. I think it's phenomenal. I absolutely encourage everyone to talk about it. Are are, are you working on any, any other projects now? Yeah, so I'm working on a commentary uh, on Heidegger, on a book up by Heidegger, sometimes considered his, uh, by some considered his second magnum opus. It's called Contributions to Philosophy, kind of brand, uh, bland title he gave it. Uh, that was in 1936, to, right after he split with the Nazis. And so he's sort of forming a critique of Nazism, things like this. So I'm working on that. That's going to take a while. I'm also working on a more general uh, uh, 
book uh, for a more general audience on postmodernism. So kind of making this book um, more accessible to you know people that are not academics, I'm working on that with a colleague of mine named uh, Dan Hegarty. Uh, we also just wrote, I've ver- become very interested in philosophy and mathematics, <laughs> uh, the philosophy of mathematics, because I think most, it's very interesting. Mathematicians are metaphysicians. What are they doing? They're not doing empirical science. What are, where, what are the numbers? I can't believe I'm going back to Plato. Like, where's the number two? I, I'm a I'm a Platonist. I think like two is floating out there somewhere. And so it's but most mathematicians think this as well, which is really weird. And so there's metaphys there's metaphysicians at every university. Nobody they just don't call themselves that. So I'm interested in that as well. Um, yeah. We're definitely returning to a time period where where we're having conversations about putting philosophy back together with science. And and it's it's fat. I can't tell you how many times I've heard just randomly someone mention even the term alchemy. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, I mean, that's like, uh, again, it's this I, I think that that the more we can connect the two, I'm not saying the two have to run each other. But the more I think that we can connect philosophy back to science, I actually think that that helps both. both Absolutely. Fields. Absolutely, because you'll find a lot of scientific reductionists. One of the things I, so my second, this is my third book, the Gerard book, but my second book was really aimed at scientific reductionism. And scientific reductionists almost always start doing philosophy because they're not, they're not doing science when they start talking about, like, so Stephen Hawking's book, before he died, he put out, well, philosophy's dead, he says right in the beginning. Then he goes on for the next 30 pages and does philosophy because he's not doing science. So he's telling you all about what this means. It's not that, you know, that's philosophy of science, not science, you know? So um, you're absolutely right. I think we need to be more thematic about how we've always been doing philosophy and things like this, yeah. Absolutely. Well, I, I hope I can talk to you about about that book as well, uh, Dwayne. This has been absolutely wonderful. I, I I really appreciate appreciate you coming on the show, and I'll put links to to your works and stuff like that in the uh, the episode notes as well. Thank you so much. Thank you as well. Thanks for reading the book, and thanks for the great conversation. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Dr. Dwayne Armitage. If you did, make sure to hit the subscribe and or follow button and leave a kind rating or comment where applicable. Until next time, try to keep one foot firmly planted on neutral ground, and have a great day.